We are looking at Alistair McIntyre's virtue theory. And in part one, we're laying the foundations for his theory, very important and crucial foundations that must be understood before we get to the virtues themselves, which we will cover in part two. So a problem when you are doing virtue theory, whenever you're doing a virtue-based approach to ethics at all, the, the problem is that there appears to be these incompatible virtues themselves. So it's not clear which ones to highlight. And authors ad addressing virtues differ from each other in too many ways. Now, we are getting this material from McIntyre's really prominent influential book after virtue. And so he's covering kind of the history of virtue theorists as he's developing his own. And he looks at people like Homer and Aristotle, for example, Sophocles, uh, the New Testament authors, medieval thinkers, and fictional authors like Jane Austen, people like Ben Franklin. And as he does so, he sees that they are very, very different in how they approach this. So they, they offer different and incompatible lists of the virtues themselves, for example. They present a different rank order of importance for different virtues. So some theorists may consider uh, integrity to be a really high virtue, and others may not talk about integrity much at all. And sometimes they are even incompatible theories themselves. So there seems to be no single core conception of the virtues from which you can develop a virtue theory. So McIntyre addresses this issue first before he goes on to develop his own theory. Now, some more examples of what we're talking about here to get a little bit more clear on what we're, his concern is. For example, when you look at Homer, physical strength is a virtue, but it's not really considered a virtue for the other theorists. If Homer and Aristotle have different paradigms then of the ultimate virtuous person. For Homer, it's going to be a warrior, a soldier. For Aristotle, it's going to be an Athenian aristocrat, a, a, a gentleman. And the New Testament uh, emphasizes virtues like faith and hope and love and humility, all of which contrast with Aristotle and Nietzsche, for example. Jane Austen uh, is fairly unique in emphasizing, making it one of her central virtues, that of constancy, giving it a, an important role when she develops the character of Elizabeth Bennet, for example. And then Ben Franklin, includes virtues like cleanliness and silence, which are not often mentioned in other theorists. So we have these different virtues from different theorists. We emphasize different ones and rank order differently and the theories themselves are vastly different. So how could you revive a virtue theory in ethics in the 20th century as McIntyre was doing. His solution to the problem is in the idea of practices. He says practices allow you to, to provide a coherent and unified framework for the virtues. Now, uh, we should note here before we go on that McIntyre's argument does not imply that virtues are only exercised within practices as he conceives them. But in order to understand virtues, we need to understand practices. They provide the framework. So when we look at the kinds of things that Homer and Aristotle talked about, they talked about practices in order to introduce the various virtues. And so they talked about the practices of Olympic competition, which might vary from uh, from sport to sport, from of geometry, of speaking in, in politics, public speaking, of, of playing the lyre, right? Or uh, obviously any other musical instrument. So er, McIntyre gives a definition then of a practice. 
And I have included the bulk of this definition, which McIntyre is a great author. This is a run-on sentence that I would not like if it were written by a student, but McIntyre can get away with it. Okay, so what is a practice? I'm just going to use this quote. It is any coherent and complex form of socially established cooperative human activity through which goods internal to that form of activity are realized in the course of trying to achieve those standards of excellence which are appropriate to and partially definitive of that form of activity with the result that human powers to achieve excellences and human conceptions of the ends and goods involved are systematically extended. Now that is a very dense, long sentence there, but he does include what needs to be included. So that gets the, the idea of a practice. There you have it. Now, in order to work with this idea a little bit more, I've tried to condense it down to say something like this. What we have when we're talking about a practice is a complex cooperative social activity. So stop there, right? Get that idea in your mind. It's a complex and cooperative social activity with internal goods related to standards of excellence, okay? So there are standards of excellence within the social activity and your internal goods are related to those standards of excellence. And those result in further development of excellences or what we call virtues. So practices could include such diverse activities as football or chess or architecture or farming. Now I'm guessing when McIntyre says football being Scottish, he is talking about soccer as we Americans would say. Now throwing a football, which is something uh, Americans do, uh, is not a practice. Neither is playing tic-tac-toe or laying bricks or planting turnips. These kinds of things are not practices. They are not the, the full cooperative social activities uh, that, that are necessary to practices. And the range of practices, obviously, you can see already, is, is quite wide. It, it would include uh, activities in the arts and the sciences. It, can, it includes games. It includes politics in the Aristotelian sense. It includes uh, making and sustaining a family. All of those are going to be types of practices. So a little bit more about practice. What does it involve? Well, a practice is going to involve standards of excellence, right? That was a key component of our definition. So within a practice, there are standards and that's crucial. There are rules on how you can meet those standards of excellence. So you have to obey the rules. There are achievement of goods. There are goods within the practice. And the goal is to achieve those goods internally. Now we'll clarify this in just a moment. The difference between internal and external goods. And it's the internal goods that we're concerned about. So when you enter into a practice, then you are accepting the authority of the standards. And you're also accepting the idea that you are inadequate to judge your own performance. So you have to be submissive to those who are experts or at least further along than you are within the practice. So think of a rookie, you know, kind of in a sport uh, being trained or learning from the veterans within that sport. Uh, think of the new husband or wife or spouse who is learning maybe from somebody else outside who has many years of marriage who can help teach them and guide them. Now that may or may not fit in your idea, hopefully the ones with uh, a sport would. Okay, so practices. All practices have a history. 
So that includes games, that includes sciences, that includes the arts. When you are learning how to uh, participate in a science, in, you're an undergraduate, let's say, a freshman or sophomore, you have to learn the rules of that science. So you have to learn the periodic table when you're studying chemistry. You have to learn the rules of the very basics before you can go on and you accept the authority of those who know more than you about chemistry, of those who have been doing chemistry as a profession for many years, for example. So the standards then are not immune from criticism. It's not as if they can never change, but we cannot be initiated into the practice without accepting the authority of the best standards that are realized so far. So even think of music, right? We, or let's say basketball, which I'm more familiar with than music. So somebody like Bob Pettit, uh, my uncle Bob, uh, look him up if you have to, uh, set some standards then that people following him, including people like Carl Malone, again, look him up if you have to, uh, followed and uh, eventually uh, other power forwards after those two began to change the standards a little bit. They, they, uh, but they first started by accepting the best standards that were realized so far when they were early in their career in basketball. The same is true for other kinds of things with sciences and with the arts. So you have to accept your own incapacity to judge correctly, or you'll never learn to appreciate the practice itself. Now, we mentioned goods earlier. And external goods might be obtained in other ways than within the practices. External goods are things that people commonly seek, uh, wealth, fame, power. Uh, those are things that do drive people, but those are unrelated to practices, right? In, in the sense that you can obtain those without uh, developing your virtues within a practice. But internal goods, may only be obtained within the practice or a very similar practice and always include skills that are developed. So let's compare and contrast external goods and internal goods a little bit more closely. So for example, with external goods, they would include individual's property, your possessions that belong to you. Internal goods are shared, on the other hand. So the more someone has when we're talking about a external goods, the more someone has of them, the less there is for others. When we're talking about external goods, there's a finite amount and there are going to be winners and losers. And that's the way it's going to be with wealth, fame, and power. And that's inevitable. That is always going to be the case. There are going to be those who have it and those who do not. And that is just the nature of external goods. With internal goods, they are unlimited. They can be shared. They can, everyone who wants to play basketball can learn from LeBron James, from Kobe Bryant, to keep going back in history, from Michael Jordan, who learned from Dr. J, how to play, you know, the skills that they showed, and they can be shared and developed. They're not limited. They don't have to only exist within one person. Now, external goods, the objects of the competition are often a reward after you succeed. So for example, if you are very successful like Michael Jordan or LeBron James, you win championships, you get the trophies, you get the endorsements, you get the money, you get the social influence, but those are external goods. The internal goods are acquired within the practice. And so to learn how to play the game well, how to play it correctly, those are internal goods. Now, we're talking about, I've talked about sports and science a little bit here. 
obviously that's not the main framework that we're going to talk about when we're talking about morality. But what McIntyre does is he says morality has to do with those internal goods and that are related to practices. And so in part two, we will develop the idea of virtues and how it relates to practices.